Okay, we are ready to start. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Rakesh Kaid. Professor Kaid is a John Seely Distinguished Chair in Parkinson's Disease Research and a professor at the University of uh, Texas Medical Branch, Galveston, Texas. Um, Professor Kaid received his PhD in medicinal chemistry from the University of uh, Tübingen, uh, Germany. Uh, he did his postdoctoral research in the laboratory of Professor Charles Glaive, UC Irvine. And his current research focuses on a very important aspect of uh, um, the amyloids and protein uh, misfolding. He studies uh, amyloid aggregates and toxic uh, oligomers, which are uh, formed uh, in disease, um, in, in uh, many neurodegenerative diseases. He pioneered the development of oligomeric specific antibodies and multiple uh, methodologies uh, that are now very widely used uh, for studying protein aggregation and mechanisms of toxicity. Uh, we are so happy to have uh, Dr. Kat, uh, who has an exceptionally vibrant track record for engaging in cutting edge amyloid research. And he co-authored uh, many uh, papers, uh, there are 135 peer reviewed with uh, uh, 27,000 uh, citations. Um, and um, I just want to uh, tell everybody that the recording of the Zoominars will be available uh, for everybody to check on YouTube, uh, but it will take another couple of weeks uh, before we are able to post them uh, because we are still working on posting uh, permissions. And uh, before we start, I would like to remind the uh, audience uh, to post their questions in the Q&A uh, section, which is on the bottom, uh, at least on my app, it's on the bottom uh, of the app. And uh, please keep the questions short and concise and uh, easy to read. And uh, we also want to ask the audience to suggest uh, names of a research, uh, both from industry or academia, uh, whom you would like to hear from uh, in uh, the area of uh, amyloid field and uh, drug development for the amyloids. Uh, just want to pull your um, opinion for other speakers we uh, can invite. Um, and uh, this is the last reminder before we start uh, that starting in September, the Zoominars uh, will be held every Saturday at 10 o'clock. Um, uh, this is Saturday uh, Eastern time. Um, again, thank you very much for your participation and uh, looking forward to uh, your feedback and questions. And um, Dr. Kat, uh, you're ready to start. Thank you so much for coming. So thanks, Magda. Thanks, Ram, John, for organizing this seminar and uh, for the invitation. I know it was last minute, but uh, I tried my best. And uh, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon. Depends where you are. So today I'm going to talk about polymorphism of protein aggregates in Alzheimer disease and neurodegen and related dementias. So this is just a simple outline. I'm not going to talk too much, but it's important. We, we know about fibrous and oligomers in these diseases, then polymorphism, which is becoming a hot topic in amyloid research, not only for people who work in vitro, but also uh, people who work in vivo and use brain-derived material. <laughs> and I think I'm very interested in the potential of uh, interaction between amyloidogenic proteins, especially when it comes to tau aggregation and pathogenesis. And the last two slides, I'm going to show just a schematic about if what we are going to discuss today or talk about the polymorphism in amyloids, how it may affect the therapeutic approaches. So there are the protein misfolding diseases, 
And as you know, for Alzheimer, there is a beta tau, a nucleon tau for Parkinson's, etc. But I hope all the audience are amyloid people and believe that these protein aggregates, regardless if it's the fibers or the oligomers or soluble material or amorphous aggregates, they play a role in the disease pathogenesis, not just bystanders due to the disease. So, I mean, there's still people who think these are bystanders, but for amyloid people, and I strongly believe they play a role in the disease pathogenesis at one stage or another. Maybe they don't initiate the disease, but that's a different story. So for all these proteins, I think the misfolding is a misrepresentation because some of these proteins are already misfolded. So regardless, the aggregation follows almost the exact mechanism. You have a monomer and then the monomer <coughs> try to fold or to be functional, then partially folded state. You end up with multiple aggregates. There's the amorphous aggregates, there are the oligomers, and the lowest and most stable amyloid structures are the fibrins. And as you can see here, we have one oligomer or one type of oligomers, one type of fibrils, but in reality from the same protein, regardless which one it is, a beta or tau or synuclein, you can form multiple oligomeric structures and multiple fibrillar structures. So from a beta, you can form different morphologies of fibrils. And this is just morphologies, but Rob Tico long time ago showed that these fibrils, they can be different based on their atomic uh, structure. And uh, this is what we call polymorphism. <coughs> So having said that, I really want upfront to say that in vitro, you can form multiple oligomers, multiple fibrils, but it's also important to take it back and look which are biologically active species, which are disease relevant, which is the hardest question, which I don't think any of us have an answer yet. So, for the fibrils, the polymorphism or the strains have been well characterized. And we know from, for example, for a beta, from Rob Tico's uh, work and others, and uh, Stanley Prusner, you can uh, associate or study fibrils using solid state NMR or other methods for Tau, Mark Diamond, and Virginia Lee, and others looked and now they looked at uh, the tau strains also for synuclein there was a lot of work on synuclein fibrils and i put there are many publications but i put few which used brain derived material because these are relevant <laughs> but the best thing in the last few years that the atomic structure of these full length brain derived fibrils was sold by cryoem and there are many structures sold for tau there are structures sold for synuclein and also there are structures sold for a beta fibrils so i think for the fibrils it's case closed there are polymorphs and uh, from full length protein isolated from brains so it's pretty neat and refreshing. Now for oligomers, unfortunately, there is no atomic structures yet, but there were studies showing polymorphism in a beta oligomers, for example. The a beta star, the infamous one from Lesney and Karen Ashi. We looked with Charlie uh, at uh, different in vitro prepared samples and we can distinguish them, propagate them. There is a VJ, I think he published also the Dodocomer strain. So there are a lot of strains in vitro, but also Karen Ash's group in the TG2576 
they showed two types of A beta oligomers in mouse brains, type one and type two. So there are studies, but the polymorphs in oligomers is still not well established. Now, a few weeks ago, there was this nice uh, paper from Brad Hyman group, which shows that when you isolate soluble tau, they call them high molecular weight tau oligomers, that from 332 uh, AD patients, you can see that these soluble tau, they have seeding activity, and also they analyze their both translation modifications, and they saw a lot of hyperphosphorylation, other post translation modification, and they think that the post translation modification or what implies that there are polymorphs or strains can uh, decide the rate of decline in the disease. It was a very nice study, but uh, still we don't know the structure of these oligomers. Having said that, this paper supports also the concept that you have to target these soluble tau aggregates as a therapeutic target. Now, this leads me to my favorite topic, which is tau oligomers. So, what we know about non-fibrillar tau or tau oligomers and why we studied them. For uh, many years in, uh, Research showed that in transgenic animals, the phenotypes appear way before the neurofibrillary tangles show up. And also in, uh, in human tissues, there are oligomers in addition to neurofibrillary tangles. Now, <coughs> we look at different brains and you can see human brains, you can see the neurofibrillary tangles, but you can see also these diffused what we call them non-fibrillar or oligomeric tau species. So, and uh, my lab long time ago, we showed that in AD brain, actually they form before the neurofibrillary tangles form. And we studied them extensively. Uh, we and Skip Bender first found them in human brains. You can see these high molecular weight aggregates in the AD, not in the control. It's the same like dimer trimer band in AD. These are two independent studies. They are also studied by other groups. This group at Merck, they showed them. Karen Duff also studied them and they show that they affect the <coughs> axonal transport or they can be transported by the axons. So there are a lot of research on tau oligomers. Most importantly, if you inject these oligomers into mice, they cause memory problem. If you test them by electrophysiology, uh, physiology, they affect LTB and memory. And uh, lastly, we also showed that there is a possibility to, to modulate them and <laughs> reduce their toxicity using small molecules. Now, oligomers, as you all know, they are always criticized because you cannot prepare them, they are not stable, etc. That might be more relevant to a beta oligomers because the kinetics of a beta is much faster and they're normally hard to control. However, for tau, I have to say it was a pleasure working with tau because if you prepare these oligomers, and the oligomers I'm referring to here, they are at the low end, dimer trimer. At the higher end, they are eight to 11 molecules. And when I refer to oligomers, if they are in vitro, mainly they are from recombinant tau, which, is, which has no post-translation modification. But even when I say oligomers, even from the human brain, we don't, we are looking at their post-translation modification, but oligomers, is just how many units are there, regardless of their post translation modification. And uh, when it comes to stability, you can see that at four degrees they are stable. And uh, if you want to keep them in minus 80, you can keep them for months, you can ship them, etc. So they are not as 
aggressive the kinetics as for a beta or IAPP. Now, more importantly that <laughs> these oligomers, we found them in the CSF. Brad Hyman group also found them in the CSF and they are almost the same, but they are also biologically active. When we looked at them in the blood or the sera, we found them, but we did not see differences between AD and control. Now, I'm not going to go into details about these studies, but because they are published. However, we also can target them by immunotherapy. And for this, we developed many tau oligomer antibodies, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, you can look at the paper. We immunized <coughs> the B301L mice at eight months with single injection and we can reverse the phenotypes within two weeks. And uh, this was a single uh, IV injection. What was exciting about this experiment is that we only reduced the oligomers. We did not remove the uh, neurofibrate angles, but also we saw rapid increase in the levels of tau oligomers in the serum. So this suggested that maybe they are cleared by what's called peripheral mechanism. And um, it looks like this mechanism may be useful for clearing tau because uh, David Holzman group after that administered that their antibody and they showed similar mechanism in the B31S mice and also in two patients, humans. So just keep in mind that these oligomers are small and it looks like they are, they can be cleared. Now, there is always the debate, is it the fibrous, are they oli these oligomers? I have to declare I'm in the oligomers camp and I think the fibrous either not as toxic, directly toxic, or they can maybe act as reservoir for oligomers. This is a talk uh, for another day. But if you isolate from a human AD brain, the oligomers and the fibrils, and the fibrils here, I mean non-sonicated. So we don't shear them into smaller pieces. If you sonicate the fibrils, then you get a mixture of oligomers, fibrous, protofibrous, so it's really hard to control. So if you isolate these from human brain, from the same brain, and you test them, these small oligomers, they are toxic, they impair the LTB, and this is published work. If you inject them in mice, they cause memory problem, while the fibrous do not. The oligomers cause spreading to different brain areas, However, the fiber is just small localized pathology. So I think I made myself clear that I support the oligomers versus the fibrils, but I think both are important, maybe at different mechanisms of toxicity at different uh, stages of the disease. So, so I don't want any amyloids in my brain, but if I have to choose, I'll take the fibrils over the oligomers. Now, brain-derived is really important because, as I mentioned, in vitro, all of us work with amyloid, know that if you adjust the pH, the salt concentration, if you prepare your uh, starting material differently, lyophilize it uh, three times versus one time, you may end up with different uh, aggregates in vitro. So for in vivo or for brain-derived material, our approach has been and this is not the only approach. This is what we used, and now we are applying other methods too. We, we take brains from different taubathies, supernuclear palsy, which is mainly a pure taubathy. It doesn't have a beta. Alzheimer's, which has a beta and tau. Parkinson and dementia with Lewy body, which mainly have a beta, uh, sorry, synuclein and tau. But 
as I'm going to show you then, maybe all of these have more than just the nucleon tau and a beta, and maybe they have the three of them or four of them. So what we do, we immunoprecipitate using a uh, polyclonal uh, tau oligomer antibody, which is available for everybody. Then you purify, then you look, try to characterize them. And uh, these are published uh, results. Now, the characterization become more tricky, especially for oligomers, because you cannot go and do the cryo-M. At least we did not succeed yet. I, I think many groups who are collaborating with them also, they're trying and hopefully they will solve the atomic structure. So the characterization, the first you start with the biophysics and biochemical analysis. You do the liquid biophysics, CD, thioflavin, then you do FM, FTIR, et cetera. But also for bullymorphs or strains, we do, and everybody now I think is applying it, you can do proteinase K or uh, digestion. You can try different enzymes. You can complement it after that with mass spectroscopy if you want to be more precise how the fragments, uh, uh, which, which parts of the protein are fragmented. But also for, our, for us, we use a lot the immunological characterization. So we try to use our antibodies and commercial antibodies and try to see if one bullymorph react with these antibodies versus the others or stronger signal or weaker signal. And I think this is important to optimize. We still did not optimize it because this may allow you to even go in tissue or in uh, mice or in cells and try to detect which strain formed in the, in the native uh, environment. We also use uh, seeding. Uh, we use uh, Mark Diamond Fred cells. We use uh, cells over expressing tau. We use primary neurons from wild type mice and uh, tau mice. And also, as I said, we try to look at them in tissue. Now, <laughs> brain derived, you can isolate them, as I mentioned, by immunoprecipitation. You purify them by FPLC, and they are oligomers, and the molecular weight is here, between 250 and 600 on the FPLC. They are pretty pure. You can take them and run them, this is tau-5, and subject them to proteinase K digestion, and you can see if you isolate from BLB, AD, BSP, you get different, uh, uh, PK digestion profile. Morphology for oligomers, it's hard. You need to do a lot of analysis because most oligomers are just circular and sometimes they are hydrated. So it's really hard to say that they are different, but it's important to look because sometimes you can see that there is differences in the size. Uh, you do also toxicity. We like to follow the BCNS because oligomers compared to fibers, they have higher BCNS reflecting the surface hydrophobicity of these oligomers versus thioflavin T. But all these methods are complementary. It's not one will tell you you have a unique polymorph. You have to do the whole spectra of analysis. We also, as I mentioned, we do immunological characterization. We do it by ELISA dot plot, and recently we published, and it's working well. We do filter trap assay, and you can use, for example, here we used four tau oligomer monoclonal antibodies. These were generated against tau oligomers, but they show distinct reactivity to different bullymorphs of tau oligomers. So if you use uh, recombinant tau oligomers, they are almost all positive, including tau-5, which is the control. If you do PSB derived, you can see there is differential reactivity, AD, there is differential. And as I said, this plus the commercial antibodies, and luckily for tau, we have many antibodies that recognize different regions of the protein. So these could be useful. Uh, for immunological characterization. Uh, 
Finally, <coughs> we recently applied the flames, the fluorescence amyloid multi-emission spectra microscopy, which was developed recently by Claudio Condello and uh, at UC San Francisco. And it's really useful, and I think it was reproduced for synuclein by other groups. And here we apply it for brain-derived tau oligomers. You use the standard, what they published, the thioplavin, FPS, uh, and curcumin. Now, if you want to take it a notch further, if you have molecules that you know they are fluorescent and you know they bind your polymorph of amyloid, you can develop them into these assays. So it's pretty neat. Now, moreover, for the brain-derived oligomers, we recently, a few months ago, we published that you can isolate them, as I said, characterize them, and then study uh, them in uh, any system you want. Here we looked at their seeding in uh, the sensor cells, but also we looked at their internalization and distribution in primary neuronal culture. And this work is published, but uh, they get internalized, maybe differentially, but also they end up in different cellular compartment. And these studies are not about characterizing the polymorphs or the strains. It's more about understanding the biological activity. So as I said, when you talk about a polymorph, you start with the biophysics, biochemistry, the characterized structure, hopefully the characterization. Then you got to move it a step further to look if they are biologically active. And hopefully at the end, everybody, especially the clinicians, and will agree that this strain or this polymorph may be disease relevant. So these are not all figured out yet. We also recently showed that you can take these brain-derived oligomer and screen molecules and see if these, if your molecules can alter the aggregation profile of these oligomers. Here we did uh, curcumin derivatives and we can see that some of these molecules, small molecules can make these small polymorphs into larger polymorphs and less toxic. Now, the most important piece of data, we did some experiments by injecting them into etched tau mice, and we can see that they cause different pathologies and different phenotypes. However, we needed to do different approaches. So this work, I'm not gonna show, it's still ongoing, but the preliminary data suggests that if you inject different polymorphs, as for the fibers, which was shown before, you can get different pathology, but most importantly, it looks like you get different phenotypes. Now, I think I'm good at time, so I think I will cover it. So for how polymorphs form, definitely there are different pathways. And as I showed in the Brad Hyman paper, it was mainly about the post-translation modification, the phosphorylation patterns, ubiquitination, acetylation. There's the alternative splicing, as you know, there's the 3R, 4R, the six isoforms. There are the folding process, chaperones, interactors, mutations, which also play a role in what may be polymorph you form, truncation. But what we are interested in are these the amyloid-amyloid the amyloid interaction. So we are interested in, because as I said in Alzheimer, at least the main two are a beta tau, but in reality, there is a lot of synuclein, there is TDB43, it has been known for a while, but I think now it's becoming more established that there are these other amyloids in the same disease. So I'm gonna focus on these, like how, other amyloids affect tau aggregation, and perhaps it's not final, leading to the formation of distinct tau strains. And uh, this is a very complex cycle. If you have these oligomers, they may get degraded, 
but also they cause uh, protosomal dysfunction, synaptic dysfunction, etc. Inflammation also this has been shown to associate with tau oligomers and fibrils. And this is a vicious cycle, it can go back, etc. But I'm going to focus on these, how the other amyloids affect tau aggregation. And as I mentioned, now it's accepted that there are multiple amyloids in the brains, not just a beta and tau synuclein. And this is from the NIH summit in 2019. So if you look at the protein aggregates, there's a beta tau synuclein TD43. I think these are the major ones, but we and other are showing there are other aggregates, other proteins. But let's let's look at the ones which are at least widely accepted, right? And there is this new review also from Eliezer Masli at NIH and his colleagues. It was mainly about immunotherapy. I, rec I strongly recommend it, but it kind of summarized in a nice way what we know and what we discussed so far that there is these four main amyloid proteins in the disease. And uh, also there is overlap between the different diseases I think there's overlap, we're not gonna discuss it, we're not, at least I'm not a clinician, there's overlaps in the phenotypes, especially when the disease progress, but also there's overlap in the protein aggregates. And uh, these are the consequences, and we heard last week, nice talk about the immune system, innate immunity, so there's a lot of consequences. But for amyloids, we are focused here, on A beta tau synuclein TDP40. So, it's not one protein, there are multiple proteins in the disease and they interact. So for Alzheimer's, uh, it's not anymore about blacks and tangles, A beta and uh, tau fibrils. There are a lot of A beta oligomers, tau oligomers, extracellular, intracellular, there's a nucleon oligomers, and as I said, there is a lot of data showing also there's TDB43, there is work showing IABB aggregates. So there are multiple aggregates. And we recently showed, I think yesterday the paper came online that there is D53 aggregates. There is other RNA binding protein aggregates. Hopefully it will come next week. So there are multiple protein oligomers in the AD brain and other dimensions. Now the A beta tau story, I think I'm gonna skip a little bit because it's well documented, but there is two things. Either A beta toxicity dependent on tau aggregation or what's most likely that there is synergetic effect between A beta and tau oligomers, at, especially at the synapse. And this is well studied. So one other evidence for the A beta tau interaction, in addition to the many models when you, they show that if you remove tau, you prevent A beta toxicity and A beta oligomer toxicity too. But also if you immunize against tau, it looks like you also affect A beta. So, these indirectly suggest there are interaction between A beta or direct interaction between A beta and tau. And also from even long time ago, that from Salvo Odo and Frank Laferla, when they immunized, it looks like in the triple transgenic, there is reduction of both A beta and tau oligomers. This is how they recover. So a lot of indirect evidence suggesting that there is interaction between A beta and tau oligomers. We did the same experiment. We immunized uh, again tau oligomers in an amyloid mouse model. And this is the TG2576 mice. They have a lot of oligomers at six months. They have blacks and full-blown pathology at 14. So if you target tau oligomers, then this is what happened. You can see that in these animals, they recovered at least 
the phenotypes recovered by two methods. Now, we did not see reduction in a beta blacks. Actually, we saw an increase in a beta black. We saw reduction in the levels of both a beta and tau oligomers. And um, as I said, the paper is published, so you can look it up if you want. But the simple explanation was, is that a beta and tau are interacting. You move this tau oligomers, then the beta oligomers either get degraded or because this mouse model has so many blacks which can recruit these oligomers, you start to see more blacks, but the behavior and the phenotypes improve. And this is indirect evidence. Synuclein and tau, I think the interaction is also well, well studied. And there are many papers showing there is synergy between them. But what was intriguing to me is when you overexpress synuclein in a mouse model, like for example, in this E46K, you see as much tau pathology in these animals as the synuclein pathology. So it's clear that synuclein aggregation triggered the aggregation of endogenous tau in these animals. And this was shown in different mouse models. So it's clear that synuclein is a pretty effective, synuclein aggregates are pretty effective feed for tau aggregation. And uh, as for the others, I'm on the side of the oligomers, synuclein oligomers, and these are well studied, documented, these are just few showing them in the CSF or they are highly soluble and uh, enriched in the disease. And there are many papers. So I apologize if somebody's paper is not here. And recently uh, myself, uh, Ulf Dittmer, uh, Dittmer Ulf and Sylvain Lesne, we showed that we, we wrote a review about endogenous in nuclear oligomers and the, their role in the cross-seeding, uh, spreading, etc. And also, I think a month ago, we took recombinant synuclein and do two modifications, dopamine and uh, uh, DHE, and we saw that uh, they form uh, different strains. And this is also recently published. So we go back to human tissue because as I said, the most important is the biological relevant or disease relevant aggregates or if they interact in the disease. And we show by different methods that uh, synuclein and tau and, and Parkinson and dementia with Lewy body, they interact. And I think we demonstrated there is some kind of hybrid oligomers and there are also results or published results from in vitro studies so showing that synuclein and tau can form these hybrid oligomers. Oh, I'm running out of time. So the idea is simple for tau uh, synuclein oligomers. You take tau, the same tau protein. Here, for example, you can take 4R tau. You seed it with synuclein. You form tau oligomers. You take, uh, you seed it with tau oligomers, you form these tau oligomers. You seed it with synuclein oligomers, you form different tau oligomers. And uh, when we studied them, these were different uh, oligomers. When we injected them in animals, the synuclein seeded tau was more toxic in animals, in vivo, in primary neurons, in different cell types. So. There, there, there are differences and they affect the toxicity. Now, similar to what we've done with A beta, we performed, sorry, I have to skip a few slides. We performed immunotherapy against tau oligomers in a synuclein mouse model, and this is the A53T synuclein mouse model. And when you immunize with tau oligomer antibody, you can reverse the phenotypes in this animal. And this is also published. And you can do different tests and the animals recovered, which also imply that 
Tau is important, or at least there's some interaction between Tau and uh, uh, synuclein. Now, in the same mouse model, my Glee group took a different approach. They genetically reduced Tau in, the, in these mouse models. And uh, the result is that they recovered. So, as I said, it looks like tau, at least in this mouse model, or tau aggregation is important in mediating synuclein toxicity. Now, this is not limited, at least with tau, it's not limited to synuclein tau, a beta tau. Uh, ben Wolzen group showed that the RNA binding protein PA1 also interacts with tau. And the key findings uh, are that Tia keeps, sorry, here there is an R which we don't need. Tia keeps tau oligomers in the toxic state. Removing Tia forces the oligomers to go to farm fibrils and then less toxicity. So just to summarize these studies, which I went over really fast, I apologize for that, is that the interaction or the cross-seeding leads to the formation of unique aggregates it looks like it lessened the toxicity. Now, we don't know if the interaction or the hybrid or the cross-seeded sample is harder to clear. We don't know. We don't know about if there is also loss of function, for example, for TIA or other RNA binding protein. These are all open questions. Because of the time shortage, I'm not gonna go through it, but it's the same approach. So you can take tau monomer, and here we did the experiment using pure 4R recombinant tau, pure 3R recombinant tau, and one-to-one, -one because you know in some diseases there is uh, both isoforms, and at least in Alzheimer's. And you take tau oligomers, you take a beta oligomer, synuclein oligomers, TDP43, and you see tau, and you form different tau species, and then you go and systematically characterize them. As I said, sorry, I have to skip, but the primary data suggests they are different polymorphs. Now, we still did not do the in vivo experiments, but from the characterization, it looks like this, these interactions are triggering the formation of different polymorphs of tau oligomers. And the same standard approach, we do BK digestion, we do PCNS, we do the Mark Diamond cells, uh, uh, FRET cell seeding, and also we do the flames. So these, these are the first steps. And after that, we do primary neurons, and hopefully we will inject them into animals and see what they do. We also look at uh, their... Uh, biological activity, bioelectrophysiology, don't ask me about this. I have a talented postdoc who does all these experiments. And uh, you can look, see that the different tau oligomers formed by cross-seeding, they, they alter the long-term differentiation differently. You can do many analysis to confirm it. And uh, so we know these oligomers which formed by cross-seeding are biologically active, at least in vitro. This is here in slices. Now, the last three slides are just schematics. So for therapeutic approaches, there are many, many uh, approaches being tried. I like the protosome or mitochondria enhancer. I like autophagy enhancer, and why? Because I think these can take rid of different polymorphs of aggregates. Now, still the focus in industry and uh, many labs is about immunotherapy. And if you look at the recent review by Eliezer, Masli, and colleagues, you can see these are the four proteins, and there are the oligomers, the toxicity and spreading, inflammation, etc. And then what they propose is that instead of targeting one protein, maybe we have to go for combination therapy and we have to target 
I'm interested in this part because I'm working on anti-amyloid antibodies. But also you can boost the immune system or do other approaches which can maybe take care of multiple aggregates. But if you want to target the aggregates, most likely for each disease, you need a combination of antibodies against different protein aggregates. I would say it's even more complicated and most likely first you have to decide, to decide what strains are there and then try to target them with strain specific antibodies. So I think this is a big uh, unknown still. We need to figure the strains and decide which ones are disease relevant and then design the therapy for these disease relevant. Uh, amyloid strains or polymorphs. Now, as I mentioned all the time, you're welcome to ask for any antibodies. We have a large panel of anti-tau oligomer antibodies, monoclonals, polyclonals, and these are useful to characterize strains. So we, are, we share them with anybody who requests. And also we have synuclein antibodies. We have the, the generic ones but also we have monoclonals, we call them SOMAS, synuclein oligomer monoclonal antibodies. They are also available if you would like to characterize synuclein polymorphs. We also have a new batch of A11, and we know the commercial one is not working. It has been there since 2003 or 2002, so if you need A11, please contact us or Charlie, and we will be happy to provide it. And finally, I would not have presented this data without the amazing lab people, the current lab member, the previous lab member, our multiple collaborators at UTMB and all over the world, and the funding uh, from NIH and other local sources. And thank you very much for listening. Sorry if I went over time. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was such a great and exciting talk. We really enjoyed it. Um, well, uh, I'm going to start with uh, with the questions, um, just which uh, they have been just posted. There are a few from Enirban, uh, and uh, I'll just going to go through all of them first. Uh, so the first question is, how do you control for the formation of oligomer? oligomers which are 8 to 12 monomers and uh, there is a comment that oligomer to fibro formation is usually very fast. I, I guess uh, that meant just for very very tiny oligomers. Uh, so uh, you showed on your slide of your tau oligomers that uh, they run on a phase exclusion at certain uh, a, a number of Daltons, but if you can tell us how many units is usually for the oligomers, we should verify. So, um, yeah, I'm just leaving. Yeah, so, so uh, as I said, you cannot rely on one method. So if you do the FPLC, normally tau oligomers, or at least the major species, which is pretty pure, it's, it's around 260 kilo Dalton. So you divide it by 50, you end up with five to six. However, if you take the same B and run it on an SDS gel, you will see it as a dimer primer. So it's really consistent uh, if you do it this way. So what the molecular weight you see on the SDS gel is not the same you will see on the FPLC. And uh, this, is, this is what we see and this is how it's reported. And uh, now you go to how you control I mean, there is a range. The only thing I want to say is that oligomers normally, they don't go from two to three to four to five, at least the pure oligomers. If you have three, then they go to six, then they go to nine or 12. So they kind of fuse together rather than add monomer to the oligomers. So at least this is what we observe. It's unlike the fibrillar oligomers where you can have the templating and you can add unit by unit. So just keep this in mind. Most of the time, 
if you do size exclusion, you will go from three to six to 12, not three to four to five. Thank you. Um, so, so just before I move to the next question, um, Ed, do you think these are off pathway or on pathway, these oligomers? Okay. Yeah, so that's a great question. So pure oligomers, you can manipulate them. They can be on pathway or off pathway. So recombinant tau oligomers normally, after a while, you can start to see uh, rotofibrils. You can see fibrils forming. So yeah, they are on pathway. However, cross seeded, or at least when there is seeds of other proteins, normally they don't go to fibrils. And this may be, may be, and this is just speculative answer. It has to be with uniformity. So if you have in any oligomers, if you want to form fibrils, when you have more pure samples, you get the fibrils faster than when you have distorted oligomers or heterogeneous oligomers. Great, thank you so much. So I'm going to the next question from Anya Brown. Um, does tau aggregation have any effect on A beta aggregation and Alzheimer's disease? Uh, I think you clarified in your talk, if you can summarize it with a sentence, maybe. Yeah, can. I think that's a great question. We are always asked about it. The, the issue is the A beta kinetics are much faster. So if you want to add tau to A beta, then you're basically touching a speeding train, you know? So it's really hard to look at effect because A beta aggregates much faster than tau. So, however, when you look at synuclein and tau, synuclein a little bit faster than tau aggregation. So you can do both ways, but for A beta and tau, I believe tau affects a beta, but it's hard to prove it in vitro because of the kinetics differences. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and um, another question from Anirban, can same proteins um, at two different pHs form different types of uh, fibrils? Um, I guess uh, it's just what are your thoughts about that you think um, just to translate it more to physiological conditions, uh, what do you think uh, may be triggering the polymorphism which you've been noticing, which you've been seeing in tau oligomers and all of nucleon and the other system? Yeah, I, as I said, uh, in vitro you can prepare many polymorphs and uh, but these, these polymorphs, I'm not saying they're not important. They're very important because it tells us a lot about the architect of these aggregates. Uh, it's very important to study. I mean, David Eisenberg, uh, amazing work. He solved a lot of amyloid structures. And uh, for in vivo, as I said, Brad Hammond's paper indicated that the post-translation modification for tau is a driver for the strain and eventually disease uh, progression. So that's one thing. I think, as I said, I am strong believer that the coexistence of different amyloid aggregates affect the polymorphs and affect the mechanisms of toxicity. We have a paper should be coming out showing that an RNA binding protein Musashi interacts with tau and when they interact with tau, they affect the nuclear bore. So this is a mechanism of toxicity. So, so we have to be, I have to be careful by saying this one or the other. I think they are all important, but I want to focus on the interaction between different amyloids because I think phosphorylation and hyperphosphorylation have been studied for a long time and we still know we still have groups act as recent as a month ago showing that phosphorylation actually prevent aggregation so i'm staying out of the phosphorylation thing having said that when we isolate the oligomers we do proteomics we see some ubiquitination some phosphorylation but this is still not decided which side triggers polymorphs formation, which one is not. And I think Brad Hammond's paper is the start of this. Thank you. 
Um, another question which is coming from Ehud Gazit. Um, he asks, uh, he asks um, was there any metabolomics analysis for brain derived deposits of different morphologies? Kind of following to a little bit touching base on your answer, there might be congregating metabolites. And do you think that there are any other metabolites outside of uh, PTMs which you would think affect uh, the aggregation? Yeah, I think we did not look at me metabolite, but I strongly believe, yeah, there are metabolites that may coaggregate with them. But I really don't know the methods to analyze them or to look for them. I know we worked a little bit with these uh, sugar derivatives, et cetera, and they, they can form amyloid, but we did not proceed at them. I mean, this is a big undertaking to take four or five and proceed them with three different uh, isoforms. But I'll be happy to send you brain-derived material if you have the means to look at the metabolite. Thank you. Um, the next question is coming from uh, VJ. I'm, uh, I'm just kind of shortcutting it. Um, the question is about possible mechanisms of cross seeding. Uh, are there any monomer to monomer interactions, monomer oligomer, mo oligomer to oligomers, uh, or at the protofibril level? Um, and the reason uh he asked uh, it, the question is that because based on the stoichiometry each of these have a profound um effect on the spatiotemporal evolution of hybrid um aggregates so um yeah i would yeah i just ask do you think they're transient or they incorporate with one another it's um yeah i think the incorporation okay so there are two different stages i think there are studies showing i think for ibba beta supercarbonato and others show that they interact at specific sequences for tau and synuclein we know it's the c terminal of alpha synuclein which is involved in the interaction so there are specific interaction at the monomeric level which leads to coaggregation but what I presented is after these oligomers form, I think the interaction is much less specific. It's more about at least in vivo. Do they end up both in the late endosome, they interact, then they form more toxic species, they are released, or they are both released in the extracellular space, or they are both packaged in the exosome. So I think so I want to say, and I put, I move my slides, that there are uh, specific interaction which may initiate the process, but once you have oligomers formed, I think it become less specific. I hope I answered your question, Vijay. But uh, uh, for example, we did with uh, a group who's studying uh, cryoam. We're looking at if there is some specific interaction. So still, still a question to answer, but I think there are specific and they are not specific. And most likely what we are looking at is a little bit after the aggregation has took place or the specific interaction. And remember also, if you form one amyloid, which impair the protosome, impair the autophagy, then you have the other aggregates forming. So you have more oligomers or more, more amyloids forming, and this increases the chances of these interactions. So that's a good point, but I think both specific and non-specific. Um, moving to the next question uh, from uh, Bing Zhu. Um, uh, the first question, is do you think uh, oligomer tau species prepared from recombinant tau a good model for oligomer tau isolated from tau puti brains in terms of their neurotoxicity and mechanisms of toxicity? You touch base a little bit uh, on that, um, but it may be nice. It's kind of related to the second question, which is is there a good cell viability assay such as uh, MTT? 
uh, to test cell ligomers. Um, it appears cell ligomers are not as toxic as a beta oligomer. So uh, if you can kind of, you briefly touch and you uh, talk yeah. about the symptoms we use for that, but yeah. it will be kind of nice initial start. And um, yeah. So yeah. as I said, we are amyloid people. So any amyloid species, if you can produce it, viewer and look at it is really informative. So recombinant tau oligomers are useful to look at toxicity mechanism of uh, potential mechanism of toxicity. They are very useful to look at structural or characterization. So, and uh, after that, you start to look at uh, the brain derived. So I think they are complementary to each other. It's just when you work with one species or another, you have to be open-minded about the shortcoming of this species. So if we work with the recombinant, as I said, there are no post-translation modification. This may affect, I, this may not tell you exactly what forms in the brain. Having said that, I believe you just need to work with a species you can reproduce regardless what it is. I prefer full length tau or full length proteins rather than truncated proteins. That's the only thing I advise my people in the lab not to use, but any system is a good system. And uh, about the second question, the MTT, a good um, toxicity assay, which can be used, which is kind I of, mean, yeah. MTT and LDH, as he said, sometimes you have to use high concentration, especially if you work with brain-derived cell toxicity consumes a lot of material. You can do 10 LTB experiments and maybe 20 animal experiments with the same amount you need for cell toxicity. So we use also an XM5, we use Alamar Blue, so, and uh, also, this experience is important here. You have to do, when, when you want to compare two polymorphs, the only condition is they must be done at the same time under the same condition. Uh, you know, you cannot do a toxicity of AD brain derived today and then tomorrow you do the uh, PLB brain derived because your cells may be less or more confluent and then affect the percentage of toxicity. So if, if, if you want my advice, if you do at the same time under the same condition, even the small signal with the right controls, you will get some informative uh, information. You will get useful information about the differences between these three. Okay, so I'm moving to the next question from Simon Atanasio. Uh, the question is about uh, what do you think about PRP fibers and their role uh, on triggering a tau aggregation? And the second question is related, why didn't you test uh, PRP of a prion protein with tau um, since you have been testing PDP43 synucleon? Have you considered prion protein for your study? No, we don't work on uh, full length prion, but uh, in our previous studies, we looked at prion 106, 126. If, he, if this is the one he meant, yeah, we look at it, but uh, we, we don't touch prions. And uh, I try to stay away from the question, are they prions, not prions? If you want this, don't ask me, go read a lot of reviewers or opinions about it. So, but yeah, we don't work with full length prion. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, the next question is from John uh, Stroud. Uh, um, in uh, the earlier slide, you had amyloid beta and alpha synuclein oligomers triggering tau aggregation through signaling. Uh, what are your thoughts on the signaling pathway for amyloid beta and might it involve the amyloid beta ligamer binding to the cellular prion protein, kind of the team with the prions? Yes. Team? 
Hey, John, that's a great question. Yeah, I tried to look at the non-specific, but you are right. I think a beta oligomers may trigger tau bullimorph aggregation and bullimorphs formation through signaling. And I think it depends on which tau, which a beta oligomer you use. Sometimes they bind, they go through fin pathway, other times they bind to cellular PRP, and then you get a beta. Uh, you get tau aggregation uh, mediated by a beta oligomers. So, and I think this also may apply to synuclein tau, but that is, that is great, great question. And I think this could be the early steps at the early stages of the disease that these things happen, they lead to the formation of tau bullimorphs or tau aggregates. And then after that, you get seeding and aggregation of tau um, further. So, but yeah, that, that I strongly think it's, it's an, uh, perhaps upstream or early event. But that's a great question. I tried to skip the mechanistic uh, link because, as I said, it's just well known and uh, still more to be done. Uh, but, but yeah, BRB and FEN definitely play a role in A beta tau mediated toxicity. Yeah, thank you. So, moving to the next question, uh, it's uh, from Astrid. Uh, and she asks, how do you define a protofibril of amyloid better? How, how you define each of the many species we see, I, I'm guessing? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's complex enough, Astrid. How are you? It's complex enough with fibrils and oligomers. Protofibrils, it depends. So at least when we look, Proto at protofibers. Protofibers from oligomers, they are normally two to six oligomeric units. And most importantly, when it's a protofibers, you must see the oligomeric spherical units there. Once they anneal, I don't call them protofibers, I call them fibers. So if you, if you have even small annealed, which I mean smooth in the outside, you don't see oligomeric units, I call them short fibers, not protofibers. But uh, I think one meeting we discussed, like uh, terminology in amyloid is really important. I think as a field, we are all guilty of adding new terms or not unifying the terms. I think Graham should take the lead. You should uh, find a way to identify or find uh, terms that people agree on to use but it's very difficult to keep track on the new terms coming up every now and then so all right <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i think for me a protofibril you still have to see the spherical unit it's not annealed it's not smooth and uh, there is nice work from jeff court and others showing it for tau so I will leave it there. Yes, thank you so much. I'm moving to the next question from. Yeah, yeah sorry. Can, can yeah. you keep this uh, the last question in the formal session, and we move on to the informal session with the speaker directly. They can interact. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, do I ask this one last question before yeah, we move? Last, yeah. This one. Right. Yeah. So it's from uh, from uh, Anoop Philip. Um, what do you think of the relevance of small molecules in treatment uh, Alzheimer's disease? In if they are considered good candidates, uh, with a metal-based molecule, it's a good option. And before I pass it to you, uh, Rams, there are only three more questions remaining. So um, um, we can move up. Uh, to the smaller session or we can finish with them I just uh... I see there are 10 more questions no three more I oh, see below more Anup, there are 10 more questions okay yeah I just need to so, oh, okay uh, yeah okay so we will discuss them once we we close with that yeah so th this is a great question about small molecules I think yeah small molecules or anti-amyloid small molecules might work 
the, the, the reason I said it's a great question because before we always, all of us, try to look at molecules that break the amyloid into smaller pieces. I think many molecules might have been missed because the, the molecules that cause further aggregation or transition from toxic to non-toxic. I don't care if it's fibrous, protofibrous, oligomers, just, so, so when you look at small, you screen your small molecules, don't just look at if they break the aggregates. And these small molecules could be simple and could be even metal-based complex molecules, as long as they are not toxic, they cross the blood-brain barrier. So I think, I think a lot of us looked at only molecules that break the aggregates, not the ones which just convert non-toxic to toxic to non-toxic. I think, yeah, I think there should be. And uh, especially if this polymorphism theory or holds up, which it will, most likely we cannot screen. I mean, we have four antibodies. I think if there are strains based on the papers there are each individual have different strain then we may need uh, millions of antibodies and i think uh, small molecules could help aptamers could help so it's not just antibodies i i strongly believe you can use them thank you yeah thank you very much so um uh, i guess we will be that was the last uh, question and um we will be just moving to a, a discussion. Um, uh, whoever wants to hang up, we can uh, just um, discuss the, the remaining uh, questions. So Bikash, can you allow people to join, um, to talk to the speaker directly? Are you there, Bikash? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, Wong, Ravi. I think Professor um, Wong has already been left. Really? Yeah, he put it. Okay, Yang. All of you can join us. Yeah, like those who wants to join, can you please raise your hand so that I can mark it here? Ravi raised his hand. Yeah. With Martin, the Suman, Vinsu, the five of them. Magda, you can ask Wang's question. Oh yeah, Wang's question. I really want to hear the answer for the Wang's question. Read it out. Uh, yeah, he's um, uh, he says that uh, if you ask to the point to point out one specific property that distinguish one protein aggregate from their polymorphs that makes it more toxic, what should it be? That I really like that question. Surface hydrophobicity. Rams, can you just give me the co-host? I think you remember. Uh, you mean that it's, it you has have? to be more high, exposed uh, hydrophobic surface? I don't or, know if it's more, the... maybe the distribution of the hydrophobicity on the surface. I think uh, this is where I think the modeling could be very useful if people can perform modeling and see how you can expose more or less and then look at it. So, but I think surface hydrophobicity is a key for the toxicity, if you want toxicity. Uh, I think uh, also there is uh, flexibility. So, especially in vivo, so you cannot have a rigid molecule because it binds to receptors, it binds to other proteins. I think these are the key, but if I choose one, I would, I think there are a group somewhere. I think last amyloid meeting in Miami, we heard, so surface hydrophobicity and membrane interaction could be quantified. I think there is a group, I forgot. Yeah, Melasini group. In from Canada, Canada, yeah, in Canada. They are developing, I think this method should would be great because you can quantify it, compare polymorph A, B, C based on their hydrophobicity and membrane interaction. That's a great question. Thank you. 
Yeah. I have one question, can I? Yeah, just Oh, you are the organizer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I yes. guess we uh, like uh, the next question is from Martin. Um, and uh, let me ask it, and then because she can't. Magda, go they, they are allowed to talk now. So Ravi is. I think, is yeah, I think Ravi can, can talk. I, I think Ravi can, can ask his question now. Uh, oh, Martin, you can talk. Yeah. yeah. Why don't yeah. you ask your question? Yeah. yeah sure. Like, sure. No problem. Uh, yeah, Rakis, I was wondering. So, what do you think in vivo determines what polymorphs develop, and therefore might actually determine the pathological or, or disease profile for different uh, people? Yeah, so that's also a great question. I think many poll, I did not touch it because, you know, we don't want to be too far ahead of the data. So yeah. I think many in vivo, many polymorphs form. However, the big question we still don't know, although they can coexist, polymorphs can coexist, but most likely there is dominant one. And this is, we know from the prion field, we know from in vitro experiments. So this is the next question. Is the a beta tau produced polymorph more dominant than the synuclein tau produced polymorph or the phosphorylated tau polymorph? So, so the, the question is, there are many polymorphs, but eventually there are a couple, maybe I would say six or I don't know, few dominant ones which needs to be characterized. And I think with the NIH uh, uh, network uh, initiative, et cetera, I think we can tease out few of these in vivo significant polymers. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Ravi, go ahead. Yeah. So I have one question, Rick, is like this is a general question. Usually, like in vivo in these uh, amyloid proteins are expressed, right? So usually they have like a NR O glycosylation oscillations to some of the amino acids. And uh, we know those change the properties of the protein. But on the other hand, when we express these proteins like in vitro in the cells, so we don't, we do not have these post-translation modifications. So do you think like the mechanism we are looking without these post-translation modifications could be leading us into a wrong direction? I think that's a great question, but as I said, it's just, it's just there is a little bit of disconnect still between cell biology and amyloid. I think uh, uh, there was also uh, RFA and a few years ago, I think two years ago, just looking about glycosylation, you know, so glycosylation, acetylation, nedylation, all these protein modification definitely play a role. Having said that, are they the main driver? I don't know because these are well-regulated processes in the cell. So I don't know, but uh, definitely these are important. And, uh, okay, Suman, so Paul? But when you think about the protein like tau, they have so many post-translation modification sites, etc. So, <laughs> What I want to say is that anyone who is expert in glycosylation or something, and there are people who are doing it. I think they did for Tau, or they are doing it for Tau. They should also collaborate with amyloid people. So it's, I think there's a disconnect between both of us. So we're trying, but it's hard. So I cannot, like, I cannot study the polymorphs which are driven by glycosylation or Ubiquitination. Ubiquitination showed up on the cryo-EM at least with Tau. So, but that's that's a great point. But the point I'm trying to make: it's important to have an expert in the post-transition modification phenomena and the polymorphism or amyloid, and let them join forces and look at them. Thank you. Okay. Question for Suman. Next after that, we'll have Benzo. Yeah. Uh, hi, I have a question regarding strains or polymorphism of various uh, amyloid. So uh, you have a, like a, a collection of antibody, including like uh, 22 or T5. Yeah. So is, is there any dominant 
uh, like a uh, string, uh, which is most toxic, for example, in the tall oligomers, which you can identify using your panel of antibodies. Yes, I think, I think this is where we made good progress. So we, not a single antibody. So let me just make it clear. Not a single antibody, but combinations, yes. So hopefully these panels will be confirmed by another lab and then it will be available for everybody. So our idea of developing these combinations, and I think others, other labs are doing the same. So you develop, you say, polymorphs may should be positive for antibody one, two, three, or four. And after that, I think with the flames, I think it could be also giving you another layer of uh, identification. So yes, uh, we have, we have some data, but as I said, <sighs> the challenge is, do you use the antibodies only to detect uh, the brain-derived oligomers? Like you isolate them, then you use the antibody and you say, this is how they look, positive, negative with APC, or must you complement it with staining in the tissue. So I think this is where we are still struggling a little bit because we tried what they call it histoblocks, which is like a global method. It's a little bit hard. We tried to treat the tissue with BK digestion before and look with BK digestion after BK digestion. So, but that's a great question, but this is where the panels should be developed by many labs and maybe even by companies. I have one more question. So regarding your, you briefly mentioned small molecule like inhibitor uh, discovery. Uh, what, what's your thought on the, a good strategy? Say, okay, you want to develop uh, amyloid inhibitor or trap in certain like uh, amorphous aggregates, you know, because there are so many parameters you can look, but for the high screening, when we're talking about thousands of millions of a compound, you probably can only do one or two methods. Yeah, I think, as I said, I think uh, it has to be toxicity. Uh -huh. Like converting, like a compound which convert a toxic aggregate, aggregate, I don't say oligomers or whatever, converting a toxic aggregate to non-toxic. And I think this is doable for large screening. I think uh, you can screen for toxicity. Mm -hmm. But, but I would say this is the method I would go for. And toxicity, you know, you can, you don't have to use MT. You can use calcium indicator, et cetera. There's a lot of methods for screening uh, toxicity in cells, which is, High throughput. Right. So it's probably have to be in vitro method. <clears throat> yes, sir. yes. But you can use brain derived material to test, like to start with. So doesn't matter. Yeah, the method is in vitro, but you can use different brain derived, not, I don't know if they are disease relevant, but you can start with brain derived tau or brain derived synuclein and screen your compounds in detail. Thank you. So, so and Paul, did you ask your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nice talk and very lots of important. So my question is, uh, what's your opinion about the tau liquid-liquid phase separation? And is there any correlation between this oligomer formation and the ability of the tau to phase separate? And whether the other kind of other aggregates formed by the other protein, like alpha, beta, or alpha sign is there any effect of that oligomer in the south liquid liquid phase separation? Yeah, I think the, f uh, I mean, there is a new paper, I think, from Nick Cannon's lab, nicely, I think, uh, demonstrate or reproducing and showing the oligomers in the liquid liquid phase. So you can look it up. Uh, I think, as I said, if I want, the liquid-liquid phase, you can see the oligomers. I mean, there's papers, I think, from Charlie's lab, 
long time ago showing in vitro you have oligomers were called micelles actually before at the beginning so so the phenomena is there it's just the way we look at we don't look at space separation we look at clusters of oligomers we think these clusters of oligomers they form in vitro and they form in vivo and maybe they break either they form larger fibrillar aggregates or they can break again and give you toxic oligomers but uh, i recommend you look at nick kenan's paper in i think it's nature communication about tau oligomers and phase separation i think it's pretty nice but <coughs> in the lab we try to stay away from phase separation as i said we look at oligomers clustering not phase separation thank you okay yang ho your turn now this is the last one i think yang ho are you there okay i will ask yango's question yango is from korea is asking about the procedure that you use to derive oligomers from brain do they change structures or physical chemical properties could you comment on that yes as i i, I think uh, as you know immunoprecipitation you have to elute etc definitely they change some property and this is why now with the new proposals we are i mean you got to try your best i think yeah they change property but i think this could have been even for in vitro samples so the the other uh, guard we have to have is to do another methods and now we are applying the sucrose fractionation but then you say okay you amyloids and high sucrose they are also we are trying also to use the old methods of water soluble material so so we try as mild conditions as possible having said that if it's a strain and it's it's a real strain the core must dominate so so you are talking about stuff which you need 2 microgram per microliter of bk digestion so there is a core keeping the strains together so for example and one one thing you have to do is that you isolate the sample you put it in ice in a fume hood on ice to keep it for 20 30 minutes these i mean these oligomers rearrange their conformation so the same happens when you do sonication for example if you take fibers and you sonicate them or 30 seconds 30 second 30 second if you take them immediately and try to do toxicity they are not toxic but if you leave them for 20 30 minutes to rearrange and settle down then you get your toxicity so i so think that, i think the protocol affect the conformation and it must be controlled by other methods but i don't think that you distort the stream that's so often okay sir go ahead and go are you there but okay, upon sonication your fibers are becoming toxic is it because you have bound oligomers are coming out or monomers are nucleating from fresh oligomers or both ways fibers once, are toxic. once you sonicate you get more monomer and short smoral oligomers and the monomer at that temperature because sonication release heats you form new oligomers so you get a mixture but even even at high concentration if you take it immediately once you finish sonication you add it to the cells within 3 minutes 4 minutes they are not toxic after a while they start to show toxicity so so as i said we must control by other methods because definitely you are isolating you are adjusting ph you are changing a lot of things but the last step we do normally you dialyze it against pps you put it in pps and i think if you follow the same for the same protocol when you isolate from different, different frames you should be able to identify strains but consistency and following the same protocol is the key 
Okay, so I think, uh, Magda, we come to an end. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Outstanding presentation and discussion. Very, very fruitful. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, we'll so, be attending the other seminars, and I'm pretty sure this series is a big hit. Thank you. So, Rakesh, do you have any name?